let's honor our time together. And uh, Susan, the Reverend Susan Scranton, part of the program group on stewardship will open us with prayer. Susan. Let us pray. Open, O oh Lord, the eyes of all people to behold your gracious hand in all your works, that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may honor you with our substance and be faithful stewards of your bounty. Gracious and generous God, creator and giver of all that is good, we thank you for our many blessings, acknowledging that all that we have, all that we are, and all that we do is from you. We give you thanks and praise for the beauty of the earth, our work, our family, our loved ones, and all the gifts we've been given. Give us grace and courage in this time of pandemic, economic and social upheaval, and burning environmental crisis to remain your faithful stewards. And by your mighty power, we ask you to bring healing, restoration, and renewal. We remain ever grateful for your constant love, the gift of your son Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. Protect, bless, and guide us on our stewardship journey, a journey that demands to be new, challenging, and exciting as you've opened for us new ways to be church, new ways to be your stewards, and new ways to express generosity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Susan. I'm Diane Jardine Bruce. I'm your Bishop Suffragan here in the Diocese of Los Angeles and the uh, uh, grateful member of the program group on stewardship. Thank you for joining us for the September installment of our ongoing stewardship series. All summer long, we've been bringing you workshops to give you information and ideas to prepare for your fall stewardship campaign. We are joined today by Davy Gerhardt, Executive Director of TENS, the Episcopal Network for Stewardship. Davy is beaming into our Zoom from his home in San Francisco, where he and his partner of 22 years are still discovering new stories to tell about themselves as they enter their sixth month of this confinement. Davey also uh, works as Director of Development, Plan Giving, and Stewardship for the Diocese of California, and is a member of Holy Innocence Church in the Noe Valley neighborhood. For those tracking such things, Davey abandoned his study of Norwegian on Duolingo sometime after the 4th of July, but apparently his Portuguese game is coming along strong. So Davey, walk us through what we're going to learn today. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be here and thanks for all of you for uh, showing up this morning. I'm going to share my screen, which is how uh, we're going to communicate today's work. So just give me a second to get us on the screen here. All right, thank you for that. So today, uh, I hope that we will go over a few things together. Uh, we've been working all summer on workshops and helping get ready for this fall stewardship campaigns. So if you haven't been on a call yet, uh, we're going to really briefly review some of the things we've already learned. Uh, some stewardship, virtual stewardship basics, and some conversation about uh, online events and auctions. Um, we're also gonna do a quick review of virtual offering plates and some platforms that folks have used uh, for fundraising and congregations. Um, we're going to go over some pledge campaign best practices. Uh, specifically, your feedback through the summer has helped us determine um, that you want more information on how to ask for money, how to extend the invitation in a pledge campaign to participate. So we're gonna be going over some, some of those materials. We're gonna talk a little bit more about um, the various kinds of materials that you might uh, create for your campaigns this year. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about small church and big church, the differences that uh, folks see in, uh, in themselves. And really when we're talking about virtual stewardship campaigns, how small church and big church is really one church. We're all doing this work together. And then we're going to talk about some next level stewardship. So some avoiding some pitfalls, having some deep, hard conversations about money and church, and also how we can talk about year round stewardship together. 
So um, I hope that we accomplish that together. We're really excited about it. As always, these slides will be presented. There's a lot of meat in the slides and I do that so that you can take these slides and the presentation and share it with other groups, um, with your committees, with your congregations. Um, so a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is written down. So when you see some of these big slides, don't worry. It's so that you can share it. Um, Bishop Diane, I wonder if you might get us started um, on the topic of relationship and connection, which is work you've been working on this summer. Yes, thank you, Davey. I'm happy to share. Well, as all of you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, what we realized quickly was we were at a critical point where we have to reach out to our membership. Now, for some of our members, that is by phone call. For some, it's by email. A weekly, uh, the weekly, maybe an email blast that you do from your congregation, which, and then a, a basic newsletter, some printed, some digital. And then we all moved as a church. We pivoted quickly to use things like Zoom and Facebook Live to communicate with our congregations. Now, that did a couple of things for us. Number one, it kept everybody kind of together, uh, especially the reaching out with phone calls especially to some of our more elderly folk who might not be uh, too comfortable on computer. The feedback that we're hearing is that those phone calls that you all made were critical and they continue to be critical. So don't take your foot off the gas pedal on that one. Uh, in fact, during this, next fall, uh, during this next fall season, as many people still are kind of locked down, it's gonna be more critical that you reach out in a, in a very specific way Davey's going to go over some of that in a little while for you. So Davey, if you could go to the next slide, please. So what we're also finding is that people found us via, via our Facebook Live broadcasts, uh, via our websites, people from outside of our geographical area, some people who would have never darkened the doors of our church are finding us on Facebook Live and they're staying. So the trick is, how do we incorporate these new online members into our communities of faith? My suggestion is that the clergy set up a Zoom, a Zoom talk, maybe a Zoom coffee, uh, that's a C-O-F-F-E coffee, a Zoom coffee with a new member, if the new member is comfortable. Uh, anything to reach out to that person. Uh, we're also finding that some of the people that are coming to visit us uh, are, are donating money when we have a donate button. Capturing that data, sending an email thank you, uh, maybe a, even a handwritten thank you if they, put their, if they put their physical address in there, that's a great way to start uh, this online relationship. The other thing is to make sure you always have the ability for people to give on everything that you do, on your newsletter, on your, on your website, uh, on any of the broadcasts that you do, excuse me, <clears throat> on any of the broadcasts that you do. People want to be generous at this time. Also, uh, give them time to be generous. Maybe put some music around that, do things like that. Doing that and then offering, doing, doing that, you can actually offer some, uh, you can actually offer some uh, good classes online. And you can have small group fellowship, Christian formation, Christian 101. You can do all of those things by offering them every, on, on everything people see and inviting people to be part of that. So this is going to be critical as we move into this next phase of, of, and, or continued phase of hybrid worship that we're all moving into. So uh, Davey, I want to uh, put it back over to you. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. And if you've got questions as we go along, please put your questions in the chat. We'll be stopping periodically to capture those questions and ask Davey. Our own, um, our own Rachel Nybeck will be the one that will be moderating those questions for us. So Davey, take us away. Thank you. And thanks for that reminder. Um, we are in an unprecedented time we are able to beam our message out to more people who want to hear it. And being able to incorporate new members, uh, as you've suggested, this doesn't happen very often. This is a great opportunity. So 
Let's take advantage of this. Thank you for that uh, idea. So let's remember when we're talking about fundraising uh, and, uh, and the work of the church, that it's all about relationship. As we gather together, we're doing this in a relational way. When we talk about fundraising in church, this is not separate from our life together as a community. Stewardship is our work uh, as people of faith, as a Christian body. So it is deeply relational. A few concepts uh, that we think about, and, and we've, we've talked about these through the summer. This is a reminder, a refresher for all of us. Uh, as Bishop Diane said, frequent, genuine communication is really important when we're talking about fundraising. It helps us sh share our integrity, talk about the mission, talk about why we are doing what we're doing. We're not just doing it to fund a budget, we're doing it to fund mission. So let's remind people about that and the intersection between meaning and money. Uh, we're gonna talk in a little bit about making clear and concise case for giving. I recommend that you be able to do everything um, that communicate your whole pitch on a three by five card. If you can do that, if you can get your case down to that, you're really concise. You're really talking about the mission and the specifics. And it helps you get clarity and it helps your members get clarity about why they are being asked to make gifts and how to do that. We're gonna go through some, I'm gonna show you an example of how that looks. Um, always be transparent and accountable in your leadership, how you make decisions about the budget, how you raise and spend your money. This is a really important tool in our relationship with each other. Um, talk about, um, do some storytelling. Uh, always give gratitude and make sure that you're following up with tips and how to stay together. Um, why should you have a virtual offering plate? So we've talked about this over and over uh, through the summer, and I just want to remind you now. Uh, if you don't have a way for people to make gifts online, either through the website or through an app on their phone, you're leaving money on the table. You're leaving money in checkbooks and in purses that may, um, that may not be able to be collected otherwise. So many people are now using online ways to give money. That's not to say that it's the only way, but it's to say that many people are. So the more options for raising money online that you have, the better your stewardship efforts and your pledge efforts will be. Please make sure that you implement some kind of a virtual offering plate. It automates the receipts and the thank you acknowledgements so that people have, if they are doing anything tax related, uh, if they're doing anything for their personal finances, they have that documentation ready to go. And many more people are relying on donor, uh, on mobile platforms to make gifts to nonprofits and churches. Take advantage of that. Um, according to the 19, 2019 Lake Institute study on faith and giving, it's not just um, the millennials and Gen Z who are giving online. Folks between 40 and 59 are the largest group of online donors, but 59% of donors, uh, 60, 66 and above, have also made gifts online. So we're talking about boomers, we're talking about greatest generation, we're talking about um, Gen X, and we're talking about younger folks. They are all making gifts online. No reason for you not to extend that invitation. Faith-based online giving has grown enormously, 8.8% in the last two years. That's a lot. And across all Protestant mainline de denominations, churches that accept donations online increase their giving by an average of 32%. Would you like your giving to increase by 32%? This is a pretty compelling statistic. Uh, implement some way for folks to uh, give money online. You will see rewards and your stewardship campaigns will have more success. There's no reason to limit the number of platforms. The only thing that should limit it is how many your treasurer or your parish administrator can successfully manage, right? 
Don't overburden them, but do offer as many ways as you can. This is a donor-centric view to giving. So we put the control in the hands of our members to be able to make gifts and offer them as many ways as they can. Pick the right platforms. And we've talked all summer. You can review the earlier uh, webinars on where we, where we review virtual offering plates and all their pluses and minuses. Um, pick a platform that will integrate and work well for you. There are lots of choices. Um, virtual events and fundraising uh, for galas and auction. If you are, we had a session on this in July. If your congregation relies on event-based fundraising to fund its general fund or its um, outreach budget, you can do those online this year. And we have a whole uh, presentation earlier that you can view. Um, take a look at that. It also involves some technology choices, but there are ways to raise money online through your standard events, the ones that you've raised every done every year. You can virtualize those and make them really fun and interactive. What kinds of events can you do? They're, the sky's the limit, really. So have fun with them. You can do talent shows. You can do dinners. You can do your Christmas bazaar. You can do craft fairs and bake sales. And you can do auctions. And there are lots of, I mean, as many options as you can think of. I've been going to these all summer long. I have friends who are in churches that are doing event-based fundraising invite me along so that I can do research for this. And it's been fascinating the kinds of things that I've seen. Talent shows are especially fun. And you can use Zoom tools to like rate people and give out gold ribbons and, and have, have fun. It's a really fun way to do virtual events. If you want to do this, and we, we go over this in an earlier presentation, but there is a way to run a silent auction and an event in your congregation for your event-based fundraising that has virtually no cost to it. We give you the, the recipe for that here. Um, there are ways that you can do this that have almost no fees to the church, very few fees to your donor, and allow you to run your whatever event from chili feeds to talent shows to Christmas bazaars uh, online this year. Take advantage of the software and keep doing what you're doing. Are there any questions so far on um, virtual events or on virtual offering plates? Seeing none, I will move on. So, here are some campaign uh, pledge best practices. And again, this is refresher for many of you who have been working with us this summer. I'll just remind you, uh, start early, get your campaign ready to go, uh, form your uh, constituents, your members theologically. TENS has lots of great resources. Be preaching and talking about uh, the spiritual uh, parts of our stewardship campaigns, why we raise money, talk about the mission, talk about the impact that our mission has on communities. This is really important. Storytelling, mission-focused testimonials, create those. If those are pre-recorded or live during your pledge campaign, they are absolutely essential because they are peers talking to peers about why they support the mission and ministry of a church. Uh, TENS, the Episcopal Network for, for Stewardship, gives you resources to run your campaign, your pledge campaign this year. They are free to you because the Diocese of Los Angeles, thank you very much, is a member of TENS and therefore all of your congregations and all of you are members of TENS. Uh, we appreciate that and we appreciate you. Uh, the pledge campaign materials this year have been developed with virtual campaigns in mind, not knowing what we were going to expect. We prepared for all kinds of scenarios. Uh, those are free to you. You can download them uh, on our website. And if you don't have the username and password, I will give that to you at the end. And I'm sure you can find it uh, from the diocese as well. 
So let's talk a little bit about narrative budgets. This is a, a big slide with a lot of information on it. I wanted to do a sort of infographic on how you can create a narrative budget. What is a narrative budget? So when I look at a campaign, a pledge campaign, and I see that the well-meaning and diligent treasurer has given me a line item budget and wants me to be excited about that as the mission of the church, I say, great, thank you for the line item budget, but what is this for? What is it really doing? A narrative budget tells the story of our money. It tells the story of how we raise and spend our money for mission. So what I've given you in this slide is a very simplified line item budget on the left. You can take a little look at it and say this in very general roll up big categories is how many churches could organize their finances. But when we put those into a narrative budget, we talk a little bit about how we split those costs across all of the mission work that we do. And this particular mission uh, work of this church, they spend their time and their resources on sacramental life, children and families, formation, their neighbors and community. You may have different categories. You may have different ministries, but what you have in common in a narrative budget is that your salaries, your utilities, your building uh, expenses, your insurance expenses can be spread across your ministry areas and represented in a narrative budget as percentages. So it takes that line item and it moves it into our mission and how we do the work. Now we're actually telling stories. You can dig down into each of those categories and say, well, what is sacramental life about? What is our children and family uh, ministry about? What's its impact? What is it doing? Who are our neighbors? What are the programs we run about our neighbors? Now you're talking about mission. You're talking about meaning. You're not just talking about funds raised to cover the budget line items. Yes, we need to fund the budget, but every part of a church's budget is mission related. Therefore, describe it in mission terms. Provide the line item budget, but provide the narrative budget as well. And you can use these simple pie charts and Excel document, Excel tools to create this uh, for yourself and to use this method uh, that I've described to translate your own church finances into a narrative budget. Do we have any questions about narrative budgets before I skip off the screen? Not about narrative budgets, but we do have a few other questions if you want them now. Sure, I'll take them. Um, one is questioning how to attach a tithely button to Zoom. So is that possible? You can't do a button, but you can do the link. So um, you can, the, the link is a URL, you know, HTTPS, www.tithely, slash, whatever you've called your campaign. Um, and it will, um, and, and people can do it that way. Um, so, so you're you, saying a link in the chat is the best the chat way. It's the best okay. way to do it. You can't create a button. Okay. Uh, I hope you that answers your question. For your Facebook though. So Say again? Facebook, if you're using Facebook live, you could insert a button as an HTML piece, but not in zoom. Okay. And then a person actually backtracked this. This came in um, after I told everybody to put their questions in chat. Uh, what kind of donations are people getting for silent auctions? The challenge is, is that, the, that we normally get donations from local restaurants and salons and amusement parks, all of which are closed and are not willing or able to give donations at this time. So what is it people are uh, bidding for? So that's the question this year. So um, there are ways, so I think it's the challenge is how can we help community businesses rebuild 
after this devastating year um, by asking them to participate in our silent auction. So it might be if you give us a gift certificate to redeem at your restaurant, um, will you also offer maybe a discount to anyone who participated in our silent auction to come into your restaurant as well, which gets members in, increases their revenue, and maybe they give them a free appetizer or, you know, 50% off a bottle of wine or, you know, whatever they they want to do. If you show your little receipt that you attended, you know, St. Mary's silent auction, great. So now what you're doing is saying, yes, we'd like to you to donate a gift certificate to your restaurant, but we also, you can offer a promotion so that you get new business and that helps you rebuild. So that's a way to construct it rather than just saying, put out the publicity for yourself, but we're going to actually send our members over to you to use your restaurant, to eat at your restaurant and help you start to rebuild your revenue. Um, that works uh, with various small businesses, but you have to construct that argument uh, differently this year. I also think it's a good ethical, moral, theological question to ask, is this the right year for an auction? It may be for some organizations, it might not be. How much stuff do we really want? We're talking about, uh, we're talking about huge amount numbers, uh, communities in our state that are being evacuated right now. So how much stuff do they want to put in their car? It's a good conversation to have about things and, and, and accumulating more. So we may decide it's not the right year for an auction. That's, that's, theologically and ethically uh, conversation that you should be engaging with your, your members and seeing how people feel about it. If there's a will to do auctions and you can do it in a way that benefits your local community and doesn't just ask them to participate to make the donation, uh, then I think you're talking about something, real partnership, and that's exciting. So this year is definitely different. Are there any more questions about um, auctions or narrative budgets before I move on to making the case? There is a question of, are there platforms to conduct ongoing fundraisers such as the sale of cookbooks or hand painted note cards or birthday flower arrangements? Um, platforms for that. Well, I mean, I think like you could do um, something on eBay where you continue like offering a product uh, or or it may just be you know if it's a single thing like uh, you know our choir puts out a cookbook and we want it, we want to sell it you advertise that on your social media and you get use PayPal or some other way to have people send it in and then you have to take care of the fulfillment you know send out the, the cookbook for example if you're talking about one or two items, that's pretty easy for you to manage just on your own by putting that item up on your website or social media, giving away for people to buy it. If you're talking about multiple items, then you might want to open up an eBay account or something like that and use um, that service. You don't have to um, do everything in eBay through a bid. You can just say, here's the cost, pay for it, and, and we'll ship it out to you. Good question. All right, let's move on a little bit to um, making your case. So remember how I said um, your, your case should be able to fit on a three by five card? So these are actual, this is three by five, right? On your screen, if you're looking at it full screen, this is three inches by five inches. And this is how um, St. Swithin's uh, could communicate its case really simply on the front and the back of a three by five card with pictures. So um, think about it. And what I've recommended here is that you, that you describe your mission and ministry in terms of its impact. So this particular community was able to serve 52, or the, it projects that this year they will serve 5,200 meals. They'll educate 58 children. 
They will have 124 services across the various Sundays and special, um, special events. They will um, provide gifts for 100 unhoused kids. They will plant a garden. What is it that your church is doing that you can measure the impact in as few words as possible and show people your case? Now, yes, you can also have long narratives talking deep, uh, you know, going into detail about your mission and ministry, but you should also be able to describe it really succinctly. What that says is our gifts are going to mission. Our mission has impact in the community. When you support uh, this church, you are supporting the work we do in the community. So um, this is just a really basic idea on how you could take your case and put it on the front and the back of a three by five card and have that much time and that much space to deliver. And I did this in Microsoft Word. It took me a few minutes. It probably looks like it took me a few minutes only. Um, you can do more with it. But really at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say here is um, create concise statements and help people understand the impact of their gift. I want to go through two more slides on some campaign best practices before we ask some more questions. And that's about the timeline. So this year and all years in your, um, your campaign, you have a pre-campaign and a during and post campaign season. So start early. Start as early as you can in getting your committee and forming your, your congregation and being ready. Select and research your technology, how you're going to ask for gifts, how you're going to communicate, uh, test it to make sure that it's ready for prime time. Build the hype, use your, um, use your newsletter, uh, talk about um, the theme that you've picked. If you're using TENS, this year, we have given you a theological statement about what faith-filled generosity, our theme for this year, means and why you might use it. Use that to start the conversation. Um, prepare theologically. So every month, there are um, theological meditations that tie in with the readings. Uh, and then during the stewardship cycle, the uh, October and November Sundays, we have weekly meditations that take that uh, lectionary cycle and uh, respond to it from a stewardship perspective. Uh, get your first letter in the mail this week. So your letter announcing that your campaign is uh, starting up, that you're gonna be running it in October, if that's your plan. Uh, your clergy letter should drop either in the mail or in people's email inboxes uh, this week. Get them ready give them time to prepare. And then during the campaign, uh, make a big deal about your kickoff. Uh, do your kickoff. Uh, TENS gives you materials to help you think about that. Um, do a special virtual Zoom coffee hour um, and get everybody up to date. This is where you share that exciting mission, narrative budget, your case statement, uh, help everybody in the room or on Zoom know why they're being asked for a gift this year and how they can talk about the impact that your church has in the community. This is really important work. Uh, convene small groups to talk about uh, giving. And we have earlier um, uh, sessions that you can download that talk more about what small groups look like in creating virtual community. Uh, and then send that next letter from your campaign chairs or your senior warden. Send that um, the week after you kick off um, so that it gets in the mail and people or in inboxes and people receive all the material that they need to be able to make their gift this year. That's really important. Get out our information. Uh, what are some questions that are being asked either about um, simplified case statements or narrative budgets or, or pledge best, best practices?
Davey, uh, I'm stepping in from Rachel a little bit. Um, yeah, we don't have any new question yet. Uh, we have a follow up from the last question. Is there cost for using eBay? eBay is free. Um, and uh, if you set up eBay for charity, you have to register your church, um, show them you are uh, an official nonprofit, that you have a tax exemption. eBay for Charity um, will let you use the eBay platform to raise money for your um, church or your ministry. Uh, and they don't charge anything for you to set that up. There is, uh, because it uses PayPal to, um, to complete the transaction, PayPal will charge a small <clears throat> credit card transaction fee of about 2.1%. Um, so to fulfill your um, fundraising on eBay, PayPal will charge your donors a transaction fee. Mm -hmm. We don't have any new question yet, so maybe I ought to continue. Okay, so oh, well, wait, wait. Wait. well, I just want to I just want to say thanks for the, these great questions that have come in so far. Uh, Davey, many of us on today's call might be nervous about making the ask or extending the invitation to pledge. Can you give us a few tips on how members can talk to each other about their giving? Oh, um, thanks. And that's one of the things that uh, has come out of your feedback to us this summer. Uh, you wanted a little bit more information on how to extend the invitation, peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, solicitation in our stewardship campaigns. So first as a reminder to all of us, even professional fundraisers who do this for their, their work, asking for money is never easy. Uh, so step into that. It's not, it's not innate to us to do that. Uh, and it's a skill that we learn and it's a spiritual tool that needs its own practice like all other spiritual tools. So know that it's not easy, but know that it's possible. It gets a lot more manageable or easier to fulfill when you focus on your mission. When you know that you're not asking for yourself, you're asking on behalf of your church. So I invite you to make a gift to this year's campaign because of all the work we do in our community. And you read that three by five card and you say, this is what we're doing. And now, now you have something to say and you're focused on the mission you're not saying, I, Davey, am asking you, uh, Diane, to make a really big gift this year, and this is really hard for us. You're talking about the mission. Take yourself out of the equation. Rely on your relationship. You know these people, right? So in peer-to-peer, -peer, in church stewardship campaigns, pledge campaigns, we know each other. So how is somebody reacting? Um, do they feel comfortable? Rely on your knowledge of their body language and your communication. Uh, get comfortable with how people are when they are being asked for money. Be clear about why you're asking for money. Know the mission, know where it's going, uh, know your case, know how people can make their gift, all the different vehicles. So if you say fill out a pledge form, uh, that's great if people say, well, how can I make a gift with stock? You might say, oh, I don't know that, but I can ask our treasurer and she will be able to tell us, or maybe you already know, well, our church accepts securities and this is how you can make a gift. Uh, so be prepared for the questions people might ask on how they fulfill it. If you don't know an answer, it is absolutely fine for you to say, I will check on that and, and get back to you. Uh, you don't have to know every answer. <clears throat> According to the Ecumenical Stewardship Center, 97% of church members who are invited to pledge make a gift. So know at, when you are extending that invitation to your peers, you are in very good company and the likelihood of a yes uh, is high. Our most terrifying moment when we are asking for people to donate money is that they will say no, right? Well, so it's just a word, no, 
and you move on from that and you still have a relationship, but know that 90% of the time, 97% of the time, the answer is going to be yes. So, so prepare with that in mind. Your, your, your ask is falling on kind ears and people are going to respond well to it. So David, I've, there's, there's a uh, question that's connected with this. Uh, sure. uh, as church has gotten smaller, we have fewer programs and service projects. How to make a case for that, a case study for this, yeah. Um, I know that when we look at our church budgets, especially in smaller communities uh, or as you've said, maybe you're not doing as many programs as you used to do. That's nothing to be ashamed about. And there's still mission work that's being done. Um, it's the truth that in almost every church, the largest budget item is salaries and benefits. Um, but when you describe your work in a narrative budget, uh, if, we, if we think back to that slide and we think about our narrative budget, so um, it's not just the priest's salary as one big glaring line item. The priest is doing some sacramental work, the sacramental life of the church. They're also doing administration. So you, you can talk about, well, some of our money goes towards keeping ourselves running. Uh, there's some outreach to your neighbors. What is it that you're doing? Are you just opening the doors and being a safe place? Well, we're maybe not in 2020, but are you offering safe, uh, safe ways for people to access you? That's a service to the community as well. I want to remind us that even if we don't think of our churches as offering as many programs as they used to, um, a couple of years ago, the, um, a nonprofit organization called Partners for Sacred Places, Sacred Spaces, I can't remember which one it is. Anyway, Partners, put together a study of all um, churches, synagogues, and mosques across the country. And this is what they determined, that on average, a, a church, mosque, or synagogue contributes $1.6 million to its community in services. That could be in opening the doors to 12-step groups. That could be in letting people farm parts of their um, front lawn for a community garden. That could be direct services that you provide. That could just be being there and being a place where the neighborhood can gather. What that study says is that whatever you're doing by being there and having your doors open, on average, taking mega churches and tiny churches and averaging them out every church, synagogue, and mosque in America contributes an average of $1.6 million to its community. That's something to talk about. And when you use a narrative budget to talk about how you distribute your money, you're taking it away from the line items and you're talking about your community support. Thanks for that question. Let's dig in a little bit more about how we make that ask. And I've created a couple of four scenarios of real conversations you might have when it comes time to do the invitation for people to pledge. When you're talking about someone renewing their gift, um, just make it clear we're raising money and we fund these things. Uh, we've already made our gift. Uh, will you join me? So that's the invitation there. Will you join me? It's not saying, Susan, I want you to give till it hurts. It's not saying, Susan, uh, I need you to increase your gift 25% over last year. You don't know what Susan gave last year. You don't know what she's going to give this year. What you're saying is, I made a gift. Will you join me in making a gift? Um, but we do sometimes ask people to increase, right? So maybe our budget is such that we're asking everyone to think about increasing their pledge from last year. And even this year, we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, the difficult moment that we're in economically uh, in our country. But 
even this year, some churches may be needing to increase their budget and asking members to step up. In that case, uh, we can use language to say, I invite you to make a stretch gift this year. Can you do it? Will you join me? We did it in our household. Can you do it in yours? Uh, let's also acknowledge that some people are having a really bad year. Uh, some people's finances have been really impacted. If they're one of those aforementioned community businesses that we talked about in the auction question, they may be having a really hard year. And so they might not be able to give what they gave last year. Let's acknowledge that. Uh, let's say, you know, we know that you've been a faithful giver. We know that you do a prayerful um, study on what you can give this year. Uh, all I'm asking is that you make a pledge. Whatever it is, your gift is important. Please make a gift this year. Don't think that because you're having to decrease that you're out of the process. We still want you to participate in a meaningful way to you. And then remember that some people, uh, especially if they've come in uh, through our um, online worship this summer, uh, they may be new and they may not know why uh, Episcopalians or why this congregation uh, raises money through pledges or what goes into that. So ask them, you know, give them the information, extend the invitation to learn more about why Episcopalians pledge and what that means for our budget, how we raise our money, how we forecast next year's budget, and the tools that we use to do that. So these are a couple of ways uh, that I have um, thought through on typical conversations that you may have when it comes to pledge um, to making the ask. And I want to go through one more slide before we, I see that some questions are coming in. That's great. One more slide before we uh, ask some questions. Um, there are things you can control as the person making the invitation. There are things you cannot control. So knowing those and making peace with those ahead of time helps you prepare to make your gift and make your invitation to others. You can control how well you make the case, right? Do you know why people are giving? Do you know the mission and the impact? What you can't control is the financial, uh, the financial well-being of your fellow member, right? You don't know what kind of a year they've had, or if you do know, you can't control it. Uh, it is what it is, so that's their stuff. You can control the setting for the meeting, right? So if you're having a phone conversation, have you calmed down? Have you prepared for it? Are you ready for it? If you're meeting for um, an outdoor coffee with masks um, and sitting down and talking with each other, uh, have you prepared that space? Are you ready for that meeting? But what you can't control is how the donor will react or how, how interested they are in the case that you're giving them, right? So that's, that's their information. You don't know that or you can't control that. All you can do is present your case the best way you can. Uh, you can control how much time you have. So um, that's to say maybe if you don't have the time to ask 25 people this year to have personal conversations with you during the pledge cycle, um, don't volunteer to do 25 <laughs> asks. Uh, take the ones that you can manage and know your own workload. You can control that. You can also control how warm you are, how safe and ready to make that ask you feel, uh, how you are going to do that and how you customize the information. You might say, Davey, I know that you work at the food program on Saturday mornings. I see you there all the time. Do you know the impact that your work has? Uh, your gifts are going toward that ministry. Make it personalized based on what you know about your fellow members. So these are some things that you can and can't control. Knowing that helps us feel comfortable when we go into making an ask. There are some things that are totally out of our control some things we can spend time preparing on. What are some questions that you all might have? Mm 
There isn't, uh, uh, no new questions have popped up. Uh, there was a question about whether or not we could say to those who were asking them to increase that, you know, for those who are, can they do that because there are others who have not been able to give. But uh, you've answered that question. And other than that, you're doing great. And you're uh, keeping ahead of everyone's questions. Well, I like that. Good. So, so if I can just say, one of the comments we hear most often, Davey, from stewardship committees is that some of the programs only work for technologically savvy congregations or larger congregations. Do you have any experience that indicates otherwise? Yeah, I think we definitely do this year. Um, as we have moved through um, this summer and we have seen how the pandemic has um, brought us together and how technology has brought us together in ways that big church, small church may not matter in the same ways that it used to when we're talking about virtual campaigns and virtual fundraising. So yes, let's say, let's be clear. There are some technology challenges. Uh, not everyone is on Zoom, Google Hangouts or Facebook. So you're going to need to create some strategies for people to be able to reach out on those platforms. So you know your community, you know how um, comfortable they are with technology. One of the things I love about Zoom and have come to appreciate it about since I've spent, I spend about six hours on Zoom a day, it feels like sometimes more, um, a lot of stuff is happening on Zoom. It works great on your phone, it works great on your your laptop or your desktop, um, and you can access all the video features that you want. If that isn't comfortable for you, or if you have folks in your congregation that don't know how to use that or access it, you can also dial up, use your telephone as a phone, imagine that, um, to dial into Zoom. You can't see and be seen, but you can hear and be heard. And that is a way for everyone to participate, regardless of their tech savviness or their uh, ability to sign on to Zoom. So come up with some strategies to help people do that. Also, not everyone feels safe online. Let's be clear that online uh, has challenges when it comes to um, people knowing who they are, um, people presenting themselves. Uh, and so that's why Zoom and Facebook have some security features that give us uh, as the hosts of a meeting some tools to keep the conversations safe, to use mute or video off and on, uh, or to even um, ban somebody from a room if they have presented uh, inappropriate content. Um, so that there are ways to keep the community safe online. You can use registration functions so that people have to register like you did this morning. You had to register for this call uh, and that lets the people who are monitoring that know, oh, that's a name that we expect. We know this person, we can match it to their account. So keep, keep in mind that there are some great tools for security out there. Um, small churches do have some challenges sometimes in pledge campaigns in general. Let's remember that volunteers are stretched. They've been relied on to do a lot of work and they also are raising families. They're schooling their kids at home. They are working from home. They are taxed and burdened. We've all been reading the articles all summer about how our work-life balance has gone away even worse in the pandemic. Because, uh, because we are always just mixing everything together. So yeah, people are stretched and stressed this year. Uh, that's a big church and a small church phenomenon. But, but uh, knowing that and preparing for that helps even a small congregation with just a few volunteers um, be comfortable and ready for that work. Um, engaging the congregation in small groups might feel like a burden. And as we do these small group conversations in our stewardship campaigns this year, um, that's really important to know that the deep formation that happens is really inspirational work. Um, your mission-focused narrative budget 
it might seem difficult to explain. And we had a question about that earlier. In small program churches, how do you explain the work of the budget when it's in a narrative form? There are there's still great work to do. There's still great ways that you can explain that work. So even if you're a small congregation, you can still celebrate the work that you are doing missionally and get the word out there. Uh, and finally, um, TENS provides you free resources, so you don't have to be a large budget, big church with, um, you know, buying into big stewardship packages. You can use the TENS resources for free. Uh, they work whether you are virtual or in person. They work whether you are big or small. They work. Um, so consider that when you are thinking about uh, your stewardship campaigns this year. The important thing to remember is that fundraising in church is a, an essential part of how churches run. And whether you're small or large, whether you have a staff or you're all volunteer, uh, you can do this work when you think about it and strategize and plan for it and do the preparation with your volunteers up front so that they know what to expect. Uh, we created an earlier, um, uh, in an earlier, presentation, some job descriptions for your, um, your stewardship folks and helping them. Uh, so go back to that campaign or that, those resources and take a look. You can, you can help people manage and prepare for this. Are there any questions about small church, big church, or anything that we've talked about? There, uh, yes. So the first question is, how should a small church with older members who are locked out of local physical outreach events, how is it that a place like that can compete with the visual appeals that are made by the national, international, um, uh, nonprofits, environmental nonprofits, and with all of the disasters, um, they said political disasters, but actually I would <laughs> add on to that the environmental. Oh, maybe it's the national, international, environmental, and political disasters. All of those disasters. Right. So, yeah. How do you compete against the Red Cross, who's helping right. people in California and Oregon? Sure. Um, great question. Uh, fundraisers all over are always talking about competition for the charitable dollar. If you didn't think fundraisers were competitive people, now you know. Um, so we are always thinking about that. And it comes down to mission and local impact. What your church has on the Red Cross and on um, any national huh. event is that you are impacting <coughs> your members and your donors and your community, right? <coughs> Your church is raising money uh, for your members, for your programs. It's very local and it's very specific. Uh, also, um, a simplified case statement like the one I shared before, which really, I, it took me 10 minutes to create that in Microsoft Word, um, can be just as compelling as the glossy, slick presentation from a nonprofit that spends hundreds of thousands or more on its fundraising work every year. It's because you're telling your local story and making it very personal. So if you can help your members remember and, and, and engage on the fact that you're serving 5,200 meals this year to people who need them, that might be the compelling thing that they, oh, I'm a part of that work. Uh, when you give to the Red Cross, and I'm not suggesting that you not give to Disaster Relief or to the Sierra Club or to your local other, your arts organizations, they all need support. Um, but I'm saying that your church community is a very local place where important work is being done. And if you understand the mission and impact and you can communicate that to your members, uh, it's, it's a good way to do it. Uh, also, you, you started your question with talking about older members, um, and I want to make a plug 
for um, if you're not having conversations with them about planned giving uh, and other ways that they can contribute in the future and toward the future of the church. Uh, as our membership gets older, we need to have those conversations about planned gifts. We'll be doing um, more work on planned giving in TENS in October uh, and through other resources. Uh, so please do think about that when you think about your older members. So the next question is a statement of a big thank you for the TENS resources that they are exceptional and they've answered all the questions. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, and they really like the graphics this year. So well done. Uh, question is, should the clergy be a small group leader or even participate in small groups that you were talking about? So what's the role of the clergy? Um, and I'm going to throw in there, is that different based on church size? Okay, I that's a fair question. Um, so first of all, I'm a, I'm a lay person and a fundraiser. And I think that fundraising should be lay led. Uh, that's a theological statement as much as it is a practical statement. Um, I think that because um, our members are the reason that we are doing, you know, our members in our community are the reason we're doing this work, and they are the ones that support this work. They should be really engaged in how the money is raised and how it's spent. So I think when lay folks get involved in the small group process, in the stewardship campaign process, it is very much an authentic story because it's their story, right? They're telling their story, which isn't to say that clergy don't also have authenticity in the fundraising process and don't have their own stories to say, but it's to say that the, the lay folks who get involved in leadership of pledge campaigns, um, have something at stake, and that's their church and the work that they're doing in the community. I think that um, I think that having been in, in groups with clergy and without clergy, that the conversations are different, uh, and that's not to say one's better than the other, but I think sometimes when clergy are in a small group process, even if they're not leading it, um, the conversation is different because they have a different authority. Uh, and that's a beautiful part of our Anglican tradition. It's also sometimes just a different dynamic. And so um, I would ask, like, what is the work that needs to be done in your small groups? If it's getting people to talk to each other, then sometimes um, not having the clergy participate is, which isn't to say that clergy can't help people talk together. They do that all the time. But when clergy folks are in the room, um, people tend to look to them for support and answers uh, rather than looking inward sometimes. So I like it when, when we can try to keep these as lay led as possible. Obviously, if it comes down to a number, uh, an issue of numbers, you have X number of people uh, and X number of small groups and you have clergy that should be running them because you have this, you know, it all works out in the numbers. Uh, clergy are absolutely beautiful at leading small groups and have good boundaries and good process. So rely on them. So a typical both and answer. Well, that's, thank, thank you. And thank you for all these great questions and, and thank you for the kudos to TENS. But you know, Davey, we covered tough conversations about money in one of our earlier sessions. But it seems that as the fall approaches, things aren't any different in the economy. Can we go over those tips to yeah. guide stewardship committees through these difficult conversations that we're going to be have to have this year? Yes. Um, let's talk about that real quick. Um, and again, this is part of, we talked in the making the ask in the peer to peer invitation, being prepared, right? So let's be prepared for some of the really tough conversations that we're gonna have to have this year. One of them is, um, let's, let's face it, there's economic fallout. It's uh, regional and community. It's different from one place to another, uh, but it's out there. So let's talk about that, name it. There's no shame uh, in pledging less than you did last year. Every gift matters. So be prepared 
uh, and help people understand that all we want is 100% participation this year. Uh, do what you can, understanding that some people may not be able to do what they've done in years past. But also remember, some families and households are not struggling. Some members um, are fully employed and they've actually reduced some of their um, expenses because they're not going out to shows or movies or dinners uh, and they may have more money to put into um, a stewardship campaign. So if that happy surprise is a part of that household, um, ask for an increase, right? So we shouldn't assume everyone is struggling. Not everyone is experiencing the economic fallout in the same way. Every conversation about pledges is a pastoral one. So this comes up over and over again. Should our clergy know what people are giving? Should, our, uh, should we involve our clergy in the work of stewardship and fundraising? And this is a big yes to that. Uh, our clergy know what is happening with their, their flock. That's one of the things that we ask our pastors to know about. And so it's, it's a reciprocal process in stewardship. Our uh, clergy should talk with the person who's assigned to a family, if that's the way you're running your stewardship, and say, you know, they've had a really tough year this year. This may come up in their stewardship. So be prepared. Now, that's not to say that anybody has to talk about the amount they've given. Uh, that can stay off the list if you want it to, but the clergy should be able to say, Davies had a really difficult year, so when you talk with him about his gift this year, go into that. Conversely, if you talk with Davy about his pledge and you realize he's had a really tough year uh, and you didn't know that because he's been hiding it from everyone, uh, but you discover it, you might tell the clergy, you know, Davy really needs a phone call. Some, some terrible things have happened in his life this year. Reach out to him. So that reciprocity and trust uh, with our clergy is really important. Pastoral uh, conversations are theological and they are about, our money is about our pastoral theology in so many, so many ways when it comes to our pledge campaigns. Let's also remind people that even though it's a bad year, the work of the church is still happening. The church doors may be open or closed, but our churches are open and we are doing work uh, even in these tough times. Uh, some of our congregations may be facing cuts and that's always an awkward time when we go into stewardship season and pledge drives. Uh, people might have questions. Why am I being asked to give the same or more if, if we have fewer programs or we're making cuts? Keep the conversation focused on the mission. Help, um, you know, help us all understand that maybe we've lost income from our space rental this year uh, and that's tragic and it's really impacted our budget and so maybe we've had to make some really hard decisions but we still need your giving um, and we might need you to step up if you can uh, so that we so that we can build ourselves back up did your conversation congregation uh, apply for and receive the SBA PPP loan uh, that shows us all that our administration, our treasurer, our clergy have been thinking about our viability and our sustainability all year long. And they've already done some really hard work uh, to try and keep our church functioning and working and open. Uh, and how to talk about stewardship when we don't know what 2021 is gonna look like. Um, who knows, right? 2020 keeps surprising us with new things um, new, new, new moments. Um, and so making pledges to talk about 2021, <laughs> who knows what 2021 is going to look like. But let's remember a few things. Christians are people of hope. We've been through hard times before. We've been through times where it's looked impossible and we have unified and pulled through. Rely on that history of what it is to be the body of Christ and to be able to be injured and recover from injury, we're going to get through this. Uh, and we are going to be strong Christian communities. 
Uh, we can also ask um, for people to make gifts out of appreciated assets. The stock market has done different things than our economy. They seem to be going in different directions sometimes. If people can make gifts through appreciated securities this year, uh, it may be a way to help some households think about their giving. So ask for it. Ask for people to make a gift from stock this year. The most important thing is that we remember that all giving matters. We must appreciate that people are prayerful when they make their gift and that we accept it with gratitude. Do we have any questions about tough conversations? Hearing none, are there any questions or comments? You know, Sorry, Debbie, there are not. Yeah, there ahead. are not. Um, we've been talking a, a lot about the fall stewardship campaigns, but we all know that stewardship isn't just a seasonable seasonal topic in church. What tools and tips does TENS have as we think about year-round stewardship? Yay. So, yes. Um, stewardship doesn't just mean the pledge campaign. And the more we can think about um, conversations and keeping this going year round, the better we can be prepared when stewardship season comes. So um, one of the things that surprises me is that people are always surprised by the pledge campaign. And it's because they haven't talked about money since the last time we talked about money. Um, and so I've put together a few ways that we can use formation, adult formation or um, coffee hour chats or small group work throughout the year um, to keep people focused on, um, on the idea of stewardship. One of them is a spiritual money autobiography. This is a tool that engages a small group. Uh, it's probably better for a small group than a large group because it asks some very vulnerable questions. It asks us to think about some hard moments and some hard relationships with money and how those experiences that we've had over the years impact uh, our view of our own generosity and our own capacity to give. Um, that question about a happiest childhood memory or an unhappiest childhood memory, when I have to talk about um, the evening my dad came home from work uh, having been laid off and what that dinner conversation was like and the, the, the tension and some of the arguments that happened. And it's a very unpleasant memory of money and it informed all kinds of things uh, from my childhood into my adulthood about how I view work and responsibility and family and money and values, right? So these, these decisions we make now about our money come from very deep places. So um, talking about that with each other and talking about that with Christians in the context of a spiritual conversation can be really beautiful work. And it helps us think about how we think about money theologically. Storytelling is a really important component to the theological work of stewardship. And so I suggest that every congregation at least do a mid-year stewardship checkup. And you should in sometime in the, in maybe May before everybody scatters for the summer, you should gather people together and you should talk about uh, how we're doing with the budget, where things are at. Yeah, we're about to go into the summer where cash flow is tight again. Uh, let's name that. And let's do some storytelling around the work that has been done already with your pledges, the money that you contributed, pledged last year and that you've been contributing faithfully this year Let's talk about it. And I suggest three different ways. One of them is uh, take someone who's benefiting from your program. And if, they, if it is appropriate, and if they are willing to talk about 
uh, the work that they have received or the benefit that they've received and tell you, the congregation, why that has had an impact on them. Uh, this is a really great story. It helps people tie that pledge, that support with the impact of, of, of a person. Uh, if a person, a client, can't, a uh, beneficiary can't be there to tell the story, then someone who works or volunteers in the program can tell those stories. Oh, I see people come every week and they come to the food pantry and I hear the stories about how they're going to be able to give nutritious meals to their children and that increases their performance in school and how they feel about being a parent and those are stories to tell, right? So it's not just a food program that handed out gifts. Uh, it changed lives. It made kids more productive in school. It made parents feel better about their, their, what they can do for their families. Those are stories to tell. Let's talk about also someone who supports the work. So I all, we do these minutes for mission or testimonials from our members at stewardship time. Bring it back at the mid-year checkup uh, and give a story of someone who says, I'm making my gift every week, every month, whatever. And I really love this work and this is why, and this is what it does for me. And this is how my family thinks about it. It's telling each other our stories uh, is a really important part of, of stewardship. Um, I have a couple more tools here. Can we jump in for, can, I know it's not time for questions, but I think this would be timely because okay. it's on story. I'm sorry, Davey. Yeah, no, no, no. You know, I'm unruly. I'm so unruly. Don't ever follow the directions. Um, someone asked the, they've seen the suggestion about sending out a survey ahead of stewardship launch to find out how people are doing. So I, the, it, my thought and the reason it connected to the story is that the survey is, is getting people's stories in. Have you heard about that? What are your thoughts? Do you have wisdom? I don't know if I have wisdom, but I can give some opinions. Um, I, think, I think the idea of a survey anytime is a good one. Before stewardship to find out sort of a temperature check um, is, a, is an interesting way to think about it. I would then follow it up after stewardship with, a, with an equal survey, you know, like how did you feel about the process? So it's not just a one-time thing. Um, I think you need to be careful about the questions you're asking. Um, and, and so you want to move into stewardship campaigns, pledge campaigns in a hopeful way and get people to talk about stories. Um, and prepare. So if your questions are designed to help people, um, that's great. So those appreciative inquiry type questions that talk about mission, vision, possibilities, um, those are really good questions to ask going into a stewardship campaign, asking people to recount like their financial losses and anxieties probably isn't a helpful tool uh, to move into a stewardship campaign. But if you have a real reason for doing that, be clear on why you're asking for that information and what you're going to do with it. So that's one of the things as a person who collects data in a database, um, why am I tracking the information I'm, I'm asking for and what am I going to do with it? And what happens with that data? Does it linger so that people can read it um, in some archaeological survey decades or centuries from now? Or, or am I, you know, so like, be clear. Why are you asking these questions? Davey, can, Davey, can I jump in here too? Please. You know, I think, if, I think if you're doing all the relationship building, the phone calls, the, the, the keeping up with people, uh, the need for a survey is greatly reduced because you already have all that information. Because you're in regular contact with your people, you know what's on their heart. You know, you know, kind of where they are. If they're doing okay, if they're not doing okay, so, you, so, and they're going to feel that you've been connecting with them all along, and you know them. You know their their status. So I think that 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 uh, almost eliminates the need for a pre-survey. A post-survey, you can survey people that I think I want to agree with Davey that you can survey about, you know, how did that process work for you, you know, or 
or something like that. But I think if you do the relationship piece well beforehand, it, it negates it negates the need to have a survey before you launch into stewardship. That's a good plug for ongoing relationship. Uh, it never ends. And it's a good thing that it never ends. These are our relationships. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that question. Two more, uh, three more slides, and then we will um, answer any more questions that, that you may have. So I put together a couple more tools using a common language that as Episcopalians we're familiar with, we know this, uh, and ways that we could engage perhaps a topical um, study, a small group session, a forum, an adult forum, Christian education, on what are the, um, what are the values that come out of our baptismal covenant? And there are many different ways you could talk about this throughout the year. You could talk about how does the baptismal covenant inform how we raise a family? How does it inform how we seek jobs and think about our livelihood? How does it inform how we act in our community and get activated by community issues? And what does our baptismal covenant say about our stewardship practices and our money? So um, I give you here a slide that you can use the language of the baptismal covenant to think about uh, a way to run a forum or a series on the values that lie within the values of the baptismal covenant. It's a document that as Episcopalians really resonates with us and that we know. Our church calendar, it's a rhythm that we are all familiar with. And I suggest that every season has a way that we can massage and integrate the stewardship theme into it. And we can communicate with uh, each other some of the big messages of fundraising and stewardship so that these can trickle in to our, day, our weekly, our seasonal conversations with each other so that money isn't a scary topic when it comes up in October and September and November. So um, as we move through the church here, you can use these as preaching tips. Uh, you can even put them in your bulletin as statements uh, that talk seasonally about what our gifts do and why we're giving. You can run these, uh, you can expand them into adult forum or other Christian education. And then finally, um, I don't, I, I'm a church calendar nerd. So I thought that there are very specific feasts and fasts that we might be able to use to amplify our theology on our stewardship and our relationship with money. Um, so these are great small group conversations, right? Like, what is the star that guides you in your ministry? How do you inform your faith? If you had to give up everything, would you still find yourself rich? Uh, if we truly saw the face of Jesus in each other, how would we treat our neighbors? Uh, as we move through the church year, and these themes come up in our scripture and in, and in the preaching, find ways to pull in the theme of stewardship and our resources. Let's remember that um, Jesus spent 40% of his ministry, his parables, on talking about money, possessions and their influence over us. If Jesus spent that much time talking about uh, our possessions, it was a big deal then as it is a big deal now. And we may find more opportunities to talk about money safely and appropriately in, in our churches. Um, what are some questions that you have? Again, I'm ending on the screen showing our resources. Um, so that you can access them this year if you haven't already. Any more questions we can talk about and answer today? There are none in uh, the chat that I can see. However, I am again putting the survey in. So for those of you before you leave, please do the quick three question survey so we can know how to serve you better and what your needs are in the congregations that you serve. 
thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Davey, uh, we can't thank you enough. Just so you all know, Davey uh, and the Program Group on Stewardship have been partnering together to put these things together for you. And so uh, we have been uh, kind of the uh, test run for uh, Davey and Tens, happily, happily so. Davey, anytime you want to collaborate, we're here for you. So right. we're very grateful for that. This presentation will again be available on the website within the next couple of days. Give me a couple of days to get that to every, uh, to get that to the powers that be to put up for us. As soon as the recording is completed, uh, that will also go up on the website so you can see it again. But as Davey aptly said, he's loaded so much information into these slides that a lot of this you'll just be able to pull up and, and you'll, you'll have it right there. So, um, and again, uh, uh, I just want to thank the Program Group on Stewardship, Rachel Nybeck, Susan Scranton, Eric Law, and Michelle Rackison for all of their help with this now. You know, we should all be kind of geared up and ready to go now for stewardship, but we know that there's going to be questions that come up or maybe details that you um, are going to want more information on. Uh, you can pull up the slides when they're available and the prior ones have been available on the diocesan website. When you go on the diocesan website, there's a little area where you can look at ministries or whatever. You'll see something that says stewardship. Just go there and all of this is there on the diocesan website. Oh, the survey should be in the chat. Uh, so please find that. Now, the program group on stewardship is going to be offering uh, stewardship, uh, a little stewardship hours for you that you can sign up for a block of time to come and talk to one of us about your stewardship needs or questions that you might have. So we're going to be putting together a schedule for that in the next couple of days that will also be available on the church's website. The, the, I'm sorry, I would say the church, the diocesan website. Um, and it'll be a link to that should be in the resource roundup and the Episcopal update, which comes out every week. Okay. And then, um, uh, Davey, you've got a webinar in October for TENS, correct? Uh, yes, so TENS is going to be doing a, um, a webinar on uh, planned giving specifically. So we're going to be talking about a couple of things. One is sort of your legacy societies, uh, but also is going to be some important um, information about how the CARES and SECURES Acts uh, have tax implications on your planned gifts this year. So. Um, so if you want information on that, uh, it's on October the 24th, and uh, you can sign up for that. It's on our Facebook page, um, and it's, in our, it's on our website, so you can access that. I want to say one more thing before we close off, and I know it's 1130, but um, we had a, an amazing member of the LA Diocese, first time ever, write us a hymn for um, for stewardship based on the faith-filled generosity theme. Um, and he has given us use of that and permission to use it. Uh, I'm gonna send it to um, Bishop Diane to put up on the website as well. Um, if anyone records it, uh, please post it to the TENS Facebook. We would love to hear how it sounds. Um, but this is the most amazing thing, I love it. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for um, writing us a hymn and being inspired by faithful generosity and getting, uh, getting it out there. Yes, yeah, Stephen from uh, uh, St. Wilfred's Hunt Huntington Beach, correct? Yes. Yes, that's me. It's fantastic. And, and it's, I think it's all because, you know, we're here doing all of this together. So look for our stewardship uh, 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 hours for you. Uh, you can always email one of us as, as well to suggest a time that might work for you as, for you too. So it's uh, myself, Susan Scranton, Rachel Nybeck, Eric Law, Michelle Rackison. Okay. Now I've asked uh, uh, if there's no more questions or comments. Rachel, how are we doing on questions or comments? I think we're all fine. Okay. Then I'd, I'd like to ask the Reverend uh, Eric Law to please close us in prayer.
Eric, you're muted. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, just uh, uh, I want to uh, um, talk very quickly about pre preparation for the upcoming election. I want to create dialogue communities around important issues, uh, around uh, uh, U.S. documents, creating community before the election and committing to, to stay together after the election. If any of you are interested in that and train, uh, providing a facilitator to do that, contact me. Okay, so just a quick, um, let us pray. O oh God of abundance and grace, in this time of perceived scarcity, when so many things seem to close, give us the grace and courage to open doors that we didn't know were there. Connect us with the source of your creative power. Help us tell our stories through the mission and ministry and how they are part of your yearning for our communities and this earth. Challenging us to see money for what it is, a human creation to enhance the exchanges of your goods. Help us discover amazing ways to share the resources that you have given us, not just those facilitated by sharing of money, but also sharing the development of our currency of relationship, truth, and wellness. And by circulating these resources, we can praise you from whom all blessings flow. So your blessing may circulate through the world so all may grow and vanquishing fear so all may give, and widening grace so all may live. Amen. And before we go, I, I, I forgot to mention uh, a, a great thank you to our interpreter, Ada Ramirez. Every one of these has been interpreted into Spanish and the, the documents have been made in Spanish as well. So thank you, Ada. Thank you, Ada. So look for the documents on the diocesan website in the next couple of days. It's not going to be until next week when the staff gets back in. Uh, but I want to, again, just a big thank you to Davey and Tens and the program group on stewardship uh, and to all of you for being here. Thank you. God bless you. Diane, one thing for those of you who are asking where on the diocesan website, if you go to the diocesan website and you do slash stewardship, that's where you'll find it, just so you know.